thanks for coming to my talk today. I'm going to talk a wee bit about what I like to call robot pedantry and human empathy. So who am I, first of all? So I'm the homebrew project leader. I guess that just means I'm a maintainer who's been around for a wee while and the other maintainers have voted for me to sort of do some figureheady stuff and make some decisions and stuff like that. But I also have a wee GitHub hat I wear on occasion. I'm a staff engineer on the communities team at GitHub, which is nice to be able to see open source through both ends of the telescope. Um, so what am I talking about today? Well, the Homebrew Package Manager, for those of you who haven't heard of it or used it, it's, we call it the missing package manager for Mac OS or Linux. Um, the Linux is in parentheses because there's a lot more Linux package managers, real package managers, I like to call them, whereas Mac OS doesn't ship with a package manager itself. So we are a decent package manager if you're using Mac OS. Think of it like the app store for your terminal. So Homebrew for me has been the first open source project that I've ever really meaningfully maintained. Um, and the first one where I've had to review and merge contributions that have come in from other people rather than just working on stuff by myself or fiddling around with my friends. So a little bit of the kind of numbers behind Homebrew. So it's one of the more active community projects on GitHub. It, back in the days when GitHub used to release their kind of yearly stats of the most active ones, we would sort of get, you know, most forks or watchers or whatever every so often. But those days are now long gone with the mighty VS code and things like that, much higher up in the list than we are. But we've been going for about 12 years. We've still got under 30 maintainers. Um, we've never had really more than that. When I originally kind of wrote the blog post behind this talk, I've said we've always had under 20, so it's nice that we've had a little bit of growth. We've had over 9,000 contributors. Figuring out the exact numbers is kind of tricky because of all the interlays between the different repos we've got. And similarly, we've got over a million users. Again, the exact number is tricky, but we've got some analytics that sort of give us some vague insights over that. So over those 12 years, I've had to figure out how to manage the huge numbers of contributions we get from lots of new contributors and ensure that we deliver a good experience to users in a way that's pleasant and efficient for our maintainers, for our contributors, and for all our users. So I'm gonna split this process down into three ways that I like to think about it. So walking through the kind of history of homebrew and how we've done things, there's a certain amount of manual process that we started with. Then we have a thing that we're gonna call brew test bot that came in and made things a little bit better. But then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the things you need to make sure that you don't lose through this process. So first manual process. I mean, this is how all open source projects are gonna really start. And back in the day when Homebrew started, uh, we were pretty, I think we were uh, less than two years after GitHub went public, the project was created. And it was created as a very sort of GitHub centric open source project from the outset. So like our original process for managing contributions back in the, in the really old days when we started um, Homebrew, well, I, I didn't start it, but I got involved in the first, I think six months or something of the project. So back then you didn't even have pull requests. People would create issues and link commits on their forks in the issue. So then you would add your Git remote, you would cherry pick the commits across, and then you would test if their stuff worked. And then if it did, you push it to the master branch with no CI support or anything like that. And some very firm words from Max, the Howl, the creator of Homebrew to make sure that you didn't push the wrong thing to the master branch and make sure you didn't push merge commits and all this type of thing. So as you can see, this is all very manual. It relies on me running a lot of stuff on my own machine and it relies on an individual maintainer or the creator originally just Max like verifying all this stuff and getting it working. So, you know, this gradually improved over time. GitHub added support for pull requests. We were able to like pull patches from the pull requests rather than the forks, stuff like that. And then the first maintainer, a guy, Adam Vandenberg, who joined the project, who wasn't the creator, uh, he started building up some tooling called Brew Audit, which was to try and basically locally provide a little bit of kind of guardrails to people to be able to figure out like, well, what have I done? We call our package descriptions formula. So like, what have I done right? What have I done wrong with the formula? Is there anything that's gonna get shouted at in review that I can check locally before? So almost a little bit like a kind of CI check before we had CI checks. Um, and then, so the maintainer would do this and we would you know, run this locally as well to make sure there's nothing that another maintainer has kind of added as a check that we've forgotten about or whatever. Then we would install and push. But I, I'm one of these people I find uh, processes like this, I wanna make them as small as possible. So actually my first contribution to Homebrew, 
the package manager as opposed to just one of the packages was to add this command brew pull which would go and pull stuff off github and automatically install it for you and audit things and stuff like that so then at the end you can just type git push and submit your changes so over time you know we use this and then we introduced our kind of binary packaging process which we call bottles as a way to kind of basically simplify the process, speed things up for users, make it easier for us so less things can go wrong. But the problem with that is originally that was all built just by me manually on my machine, which then slightly graduated to kind of VMs on my machine. But you know, the workflow wasn't ideal and it wasn't great to be reliant on one person aside from even the security practices and stuff like that. So this was back in the heady days where if you wanted to get some money from strangers on the internet, Kickstart was your best bet. So we kind of thought of this idea called Brew Testbot. So I decided to kind of write some code as sort of a proof of concept of what this could be doing and then ran a Kickstarter project to get some physical hardware. And again, because this is Max and because this was, I forget what year, 2010 or 11 or 12 or something, um, this was to buy physical hardware that I was going to physically put in a, in a data center run by a company called Positive Internet, run by a friend of mine. Um, and yeah, we managed to get funded and we managed to get the hosting for these servers. And then we were able to kind of have a nice Jenkins instance that was able to run stuff automatically for us. So now when you submitted a pull request on GitHub, it would run the commands we've seen before. Um, we're auditing stuff, we're installing stuff do some tests, basically make sure the package is actually working or more importantly that the updates you might have just made to the package are still working. And then brew bottle, which is that thing that we're using to build the binary packages. So now we're able to get the binary package builds off of my machine and off of being basically limited by one developer and onto kind of a consistent unified place where users can see feedback and stuff like that. But some interesting things started to happen when we did this because we noticed that, you know, we would run brew audit before and we would maybe go and ask users, oh, well, can you please do this? Can you please do that? And quite often these things would turn into um, like either sometimes arguments, sometimes a little bit heated, sometimes just disagreements and people didn't want to do things. But the interesting thing was when instead of us running a command and interpreting it and telling the users what to do, or even them running the command locally for themselves, when this became like a CI job that just went green when things worked or red when things failed, instead, we weren't being accused of, as maintainers of being pedantic anymore. People were just fixing these problems. And sometimes when all the maintainers would be asleep, you would see the commits that they would push a commit and then see that there was a problem and then they would fix things and then you'd wake up and they've gone through and sorted these things out. Of course, those of you who have like decent CI tool chains, this is not surprising, but to us back then, this was a little bit of a, a revelation of how useful this could be um, in the worlds of open source software for us. So this, then allowed us to sort of simplify our workflows even further so we could have just like a single command, which is what the CI machines were running, which then we tried to pull as much configuration out of the CI machines themselves and into this command brew test bot that still lives to this day. It's the first real sort of Ruby program I've written from scratch. And back in the day, it was uh, an absolute hideous piece of mess. Uh, it's still not very nice nowadays, but you know, it does its job. It has built and uh, pushed a lot of changes over the years. But um, we were able to adapt that to do more and more. We we're able to allow that to handle third-party repositories, which we call taps and stuff like that. So it's able to kind of provide that functionality and continuous integration to other users building other parts of Homebrew as well. So what we've been trying to do over the years is turn as many of these kind of repeated review comments. If you see yourself making the same review comment on multiple PRs or opening and closing the same PR multiple times where someone's submitting a change you want that you don't want, then we try and turn this into automated checks that people can guide, kind of have locally running or at least provided on CI so that they can get this feedback without humans having to do it for you. And also we've started moving towards using stuff like Rubicop as well for getting unified code style for everything. So again, that removes another source of arguments that instead of people being pedantic and saying, use single quotes here or double quotes here or whatever it may be. We can just have a rule that does that. It's all auto formatted for you. And if you want to submit a pull request, you can submit a pull request to change the, the Rubocop rules and we can have a discussion of that. 
And then that's built in by default into a few editors now as well. So you can nicely get, um, particularly if you've been able to auto-formatting, you can get homebrew code just automatically formatted in the right way so that you're not going to get any of these complaints. We've extended homebrew to have a few more of these commands. And while we've moved from Jenkins to kind of GitHub Actions, we've tried to pull, again, more of our logic out of the CI provider and into homebrew itself. So we're trying to run these commands and then that in our CI toolchain, and then that makes it easier for you to go and um, reproduce and figure out what's going on um, outside of there as well. So this, again, avoids some of these pedantry arguments and gets all our tooling nice and open source. And while we've moved into GitHub Actions land as well, there's nice other little ways you can pull in tools that are written by other people. Two of my favorites here are the action stale and descent lock threads actions, which you can use to lock stale threads and close stale issues, which is really handy. So last final bit. So you need to be careful not to automate too much because what robots can't do is build human communities for you. So a project like Homebrew that receives large numbers of contributions and large numbers of people, it's easy to think, right, we should automate all of that and automate the thank yous and have the robot say thank you for you. But people don't really seem to respond that well to that. Um, and what starts off as a longer heartfelt message on a less busy project turns into just thanks on a busier one. So my starting point for this was I made a little text expander shortcut, which would expand to this text here, just so I could, you know, I still mean that, but it just makes it a little bit quicker for me to type it and get, leave that feedback onto multiple people's uh, PRs. And I wanted it to be as frictionless as possible for me to express my gratitude to people. But then, you know, I would continue to kind of want to iterate on my workflow and I'm lucky enough to work at GitHub. So I was able to improve the existing sort of save replies features. So you can use keyboard shortcuts for that. So I now just need to do control dot control two in a reply and that goes and populates that for me. And it's funny because I, I initially thought people might not like this very much, but when I've met people online or in conferences or whatever, and they've told me that it was really nice to receive that message. Most of them, when I tell them that it was kind of done by a shortcut, it doesn't lessen the impact for them because they understand that I still mean it, even if I've developed ways to type it a little bit quicker. So TLDR from this talk, if you can take anything away, if you want to pull out your cameras and take a screenshot or whatever of the, the three bullet points that I would sum this talk into. So the first is you want to automate almost everything you can in your project, but almost everything, not actually everything. Get your documentation and your lists of long processes and stuff like that and try and turn that into code and CI checks and stuff like that rather than having people run through checklists. But don't lose the human touch while you're doing this because it's still necessary to kind of build those relationships and praise and be kind to your contributors and your maintainers in your project. So thanks very much for having me today. Um, and if you're interested in sharing this talk with someone else as well, there's a little link down there to the blog post where there's a sort of longer version of this talk. Thanks for listening.